Okay, we are live. We are. We are. You're watching Mentionables TV. This is the series we've been doing on questions that no Christian can answer. The questions come from the non-sequitur YouTube channel, and the answers come from the mentionables. This is today's question. Both of us believed in God. It meant everything to us. It colored how we saw the world. It gave us meaning, and it gave us strength. Then one day, we couldn't. We had questions, we had doubts, and they couldn't be answered. We searched, we wanted to, and we tried. We struggled to make ourselves believe again, but we couldn't pretend we did without knowing that it was a lie. So here's our question. Can a person simply choose to believe in something that they are not convinced of? If not, and God created our brains to require a certain level of evidence in order to be convinced, why has he chosen to not provide that level of evidence for us? Even though we both wanted to believe. Okay, so the simple answer to the question is, yes, you can make yourself believe something that you're not convinced of. People do it all the time. Fans of a bad movie can make themselves believe that it's a good movie if they try really hard. You just have to convince yourself. Now... That said, this is not really the question being presented here. This is the so-called problem of the sincere seeker. The problem essentially says that if I really, really want to know whether God exists or not, and really want to believe, and I'm not convinced, then this would be evidence against God's existence. Because, you know, God wants everyone to believe, supposedly, and if he did, he would present evidence convincing to the person who's sincerely seeking. So if I really, really uh, want to know about God, I seek it, I pray, or so forth, and no evidence presents itself that is convincing to me, then this is evidence against God, right? So, first of all, one of the difficulties with this question is that it relies a lot on personal experience. So it's not falsifiable in that I can't really get into your head and find out how sincere you are. So this is a, a evidence from testimony, right? And this would be the same as if a Christian were to come up to you and give their personal testimony about how God acted within their lives and helped them, and eventually they were convinced of God because of a personal experience. And this is just flipping the coin around. I'm not convinced of God because of my personal experience. So it's not falsifiable. That's not to say that we want to discount the personal experience. We wouldn't want that for uh, someone to do it to us, so it wouldn't be fair for us to do it to them. The other issue here is they, they say that there's not the evidence that would convince them. Now, certainly, there is evidence for God's existence. If there weren't, we wouldn't be doing this video series. But whatever evidence there, there is, it's not convincing to them. Now, just because there is evidence doesn't mean it's accurate or it's true or anything like that. That is for the person to determine in and of itself. So the problem is somewhat unresolvable because I can't get into your head, find out what you're thinking, or see how you're interpreting the evidence. Some find the evidence very convincing. Some very smart people have become Christians because of the evidence. On the other hand, some very smart people have stopped being Christians because they weren't convinced by the evidence or they were convinced by some kind of argument against God. So there is evidence. Whether or not it's convincing to you is for you to decide, and no one can get in your head to determine what your thought processes were that convinced you otherwise or didn't convince you of Christianity. So it's not a strong objection against God's existence. And it isn't one that's necessarily be answerable on a broad platform because we can't see what's going on inside each other's heads. And it's back. 
<laughs> Pelogia and Shannon Q give what is really just a spin on the prior religious diversity question. So this is now the fifth time out of 15 questions for this objection to take its crack at the plate. Thankfully, they ask actually an interesting follow-up question. Can someone choose to believe what they're not convinced of? Well, I think they want us to say no, but I'm not actually sure of that. I think we can believe in a direction of something that we feel we ought to believe, even if we're not presently convinced by it. I may have a hunch that a certain position is correct, but I'm not convinced by it yet. In that case, I may act or comport myself in that direction, so, sort of like a Pascal's wager and what it exhorts us to do. By the way, a total aside, most people wildly misunderstand the point of the wager as being about belief when it's actually about volition, but that's an aside. But if God made our minds to need evidence, why judge us when we don't believe based on not having a certain level of evidence? Well, this is yet again just another failed internal critique. This is basically them saying, assume that God exists like you Christians say, and that if we don't believe, we're judged for our sin. But God didn't give us enough evidence to believe. Okay, what's the problem with this internal critique? The Bible tells us that you do have enough evidence. In fact, we're made in the image of God and reflect him and yet suppress the truth and unrighteousness. The whole cosmos, it says, declares his power. So if you don't believe, it's not actually because you lack evidence. I would simply say that you didn't want to believe like you think you did. That might sound harsh to tell people when they, what they wanted and what they didn't want, but if they wanted to believe and live life to the glory of God, then they could. In fact, they could right now. They could repent of their sin and, like the Father and Mark, ask God to help their unbelief. They could reorder their entire lives to stop living in autonomy apart from God, seeking to deny and reject Him, and could submit to what God has revealed to His people about Himself and His will. If you want to love your spouse, you don't wait for signs of evidence that they love you too. If you want to love them, you start acting in loving ways, even if you're at the time not feeling particularly loving towards them. So I just don't buy the whole, we genuinely wanted to. I'm sorry, you didn't. You maybe kind of wanted to, but you didn't actually want to commit to it. If, if you did, you'd be living your life to that end right now. That's what faith is after all. It's not belief without evidence, but it's a whole life oriented trust in God and in his way of living the Christian life. What they wanted, what they actually wanted, was for God to capitulate to them on their terms under their demands. They didn't want God to be sovereign. They wanted to be sovereign and have God answer to them. And that kind of pride is the opposite of humbling oneself to God. So this question requires more questions. What do you mean by evidence? What do you mean by convinced? What evidence convinces you to love a spouse? What evidence is sufficient to convict someone of a crime? Eventually, you have to decide what degree of evidence you require for a personal decision. But, based on the wording of the question, I'm not really sure that evidence or certainty matter here. The questioners here put so much emphasis on wants and desires that it begs to ask, did evidence actually matter? If you put so much emphasis on desires and what you want? So with all that said, the ultimate question is, how do our wants and desires taint our understanding of the evidence? And maybe more importantly, how honest are we willing to be with ourselves when interpreting evidence? On a side note, though, Paul Agia seems so concerned in most of his videos with young earth creationism that I have yet to see him refute any other Christian perspectives, of which there are many. So one has to wonder how much this plays into his understanding of Christian evidences. Can a person 
choose to believe in something they're not convinced of. In a way, we can. In a way, we can. Um, this is one application of the word faith. Faith means trust. You're trusting something. Maybe you don't have complete certainty. Maybe you're not totally convinced. Uh, but you know what? Uh, I'm going to give it a chance. I'm going to give it a chance. Right? And so um, I'm going to go ahead well, with what I do have. I'm not totally sure, but okay, it makes sense. Yeah, you know, so something like that. And we do this all the time in other areas of life. Right, you have your friends who are going, hey, come on, we're going to this new party, we're going to this new place, we're going to this event, we're going to see this movie, and you're like, oh, I don't want to, that sounds so lame. And what do they do? No, no, you're going to have fun. Believe me, just trust me, you're going to have fun. You don't want to go. You're not convinced you're going to have fun. What do you do? You go anyway. And end up having fun, right? And so we do this all the time. We do this all the time. What if someone were to bring you evidence? Hey, your spouse has been unfaithful. Here's a picture. I mean, it's like a picture of them having you know, lunch with their ex-boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever that they didn't tell you about. Oh, no, they're cheating on me. Okay, well, the evidence is inconclusive. You're not convinced, though, they're being faithful. But you know what? Based on the other evidence I have, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, and I'm going to choose to believe they are not cheating on me. I'm not entirely convinced, but I'm going to choose to say, no, they're being faithful. Or the other way around. I'm not entirely convinced this happened, but I'm going to choose to believe they cheated on me. We do it. We do it all day long in all kinds of different other things. And on and on. So can you believe something you're not convinced of? Yeah. Yeah, you can. You can be wrong. You can be right. Um, I, this kind of gets to that idea that um, is kind of a deterministic viewpoint of knowledge. That uh, we just, we have whatever, and we just, boom, we, we believe it. We have no control over what we believe. I, I don't think that's true. Um, you can't just go, I'm going to believe it, poof, and your ideas change. No, that might take time um, to adapt and, uh, you know, acknowledge and experience and examine, right? But you can go, I'm not convinced, but I'm going to go with it. And then you get more convinced as time goes on. So I think that kind of can happen. Um, this idea about, again, God creating our brains. This came up in another question. That God created our brains faulty. And, um, you know, the reason we don't believe is because we don't have, we have faulty brains. Because God gave us all this evidence and we don't believe it. So it must be our brain's fault. It's God's fault. Right? That doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, because we have the way we judge knowledge, the way we actually judge the knowledge, and the evidence, the evidence itself, and then the conclusion. So there's plenty of people who accept false reasoning. I don't know, maybe you're one of them. Maybe I'm one of them, right? It happens. So just because you accept, you choose to accept a false reasoning standard doesn't mean God's fault, your brain is faulty. You chose that, God didn't do it. So... On that, that's on us. So that, that's no, that's not God's fault. And according to the Bible, though, all the evidence that we need to believe Christianity is true is already there. Romans 1 talks about um, the creation giving us the uh, truth of the existence of the Creator. Romans 2 talks about how our uh, moral conscience points to the moral lawgiver and actually lets us know we're guilty or innocent in front of God. So whenever you're feeling guilty about doing something, that's not just like, a, oh, I did something bad. No, you're guilty before God. Right? Romans 1, there's a creator. Romans 2, there's morality and we're guilty. So a lot of this evidence is already there. You go into all the arguments of God, the cosmological, teleological. You examine these things and you go, wow, okay, the evidence is here. Why don't people believe it? Well, as I mentioned to another question that was very similar, you have your way of analysis, analyzing, the way of examining evidence. You have the actual evidence, then you have the conclusion. And you can have a problem in either one. So let's say that there is a conclusion that actually is true. It really is true. It's the way the world is. It really is a true conclusion. But you don't believe it. So where's the, where's the deficiency? Is it in the evidence? Or is it in your standard of judging the evidence? Which one? And there's got to be one of them, right? Because judgment plus evidence equals conclusion. Well, it's true, but you're concluding it's not. So 
Where's your fault? Well, there's not enough evidence. Well, okay, Bible says there is, so where's your fault? It's in the way you're examining it. I have found that a lot of Christians fall away from the faith, have crises of faith. They start to doubt Christianity and can't find answers because they have been trained into a non-Christian view of the world. Right? That we, in our increasingly secular, materialistic world, that we adopt a way of thinking. It's just saturated all, in everything all around us, movies and TV and songs, and I mean, just phrases we use. Right? Throughout these videos, whenever I say mind, whenever I say think, I'm pointing where? To my brain. Why? Because the materialistic world tells us that's what makes us think. Not according to Christianity. According to Christianity, our mind is something else. Not encapsulated in our brain. But that's the culture we live in. So I've adopted the gesture, right? Because that's just the culture we live in. That doesn't mean that that's my mind, right? That's just my brain. The point is that there is so much in our thinking, in our vocabulary that comes from views that aren't actually Christian views. And so what happens is we adopt a view, a way of thinking that automatically will not allow for Christianity to be true. So the deck is stacked against Christianity. So we have a viewed way of judging the evidence. Then we look at the evidence and we go, okay, therefore it can't be true. But it is true. So the problem is either with the standard or with the evidence. Well, if the evidence is there for Christianity, what's wrong with the standard? A lot of times our standard is informed by secular thinking, not by actual, good, rational, philosophical thinking. So what we need to do is to make sure, okay, am I thinking correctly? Because a lot of times what happens is if you have these materialistic, um, must be science, must be empirical, uh, uh, just philosophical argument doesn't work, you know, kind of ideas, then you're not going to come to right conclusions. And, and so you have to actually say, okay, am I processing and evaluating the evidence to come to the correct conclusion? And a lot of times our analysis, our standard of judgment of the evidence is what is flawed. Not our brains. God didn't give us faulty brains. He didn't give us broken minds. He gave us intellect. He gave us reason. He expects us to use them. But how we use them is our choice.